كده No, good evening, everyone. I'm very grateful that you're all here and spending your evening with me. And uh, I very much appreciate uh, your presence. Yeah, I'm going to take you a bit of a journey today. And um, it is quite an intense journey. And as you, and as many of you probably, um, there's always very strong emotions with these topics. Um, and obviously we explore them as we go along. So let me see if it works here with the slides here. You can see the slides, you can, yes? Very good. So we are discussing today eating your way to health. Food is actually medicine. Just a few words about myself. Um, my name is Ulrich Bartels. I'm an obstetrician and gynecologist here in Mayo University Hospital. I have a degree and a PhD from Germany, University of Göttingen. I started my training in Germany, completed it in Ireland, and I'm an honorary lecturer to the University of Galway. Um, after my medical studies, I did a course with the University of Winchester called Plant-Based Nutrition. And I must admit that that was the best course I ever did in my entire life because I learned so much. I can only recommend any uh, person, anywhere inclined, if they really want to learn deeply about this, to do that course. And then I further sort of educated myself uh, adv about advanced, uh, adverse childhood events and trauma care. You know, we're going to talk about food as medicine today. The trouble is, you see, people are fed by the food industry which pays no attention to health. But people are treated by the health industry, which actually pays no attention to food. Why is that so separate? Well, one of the reasons for that may be, as everyone is judged by their wealth, and even states are judged by their um gross domestic product. Everything is about money. So it is by food. And here you see in the report bankrolling the butchers by the changing markets, uh, markets initiative. Um, how the big banks are investing in animal agriculture, driving the system. Also a third of our EU taxes is going to animal agriculture a third of our EU taxes. So what is the problem then? The problem is with um, the current food system, all these different ones on the slide, there's a huge impact of health, both from a pollution point of view, from a contamination point of view, and also from a direct influence of health, which we'll discover further. There's also this big issue with antibiotic resistance. And many people are forecasting that we are well on the brink of an era where all the existing antibiotics will no longer work because 75% of all antibiotics are used in animal agriculture, not in humans. Animals are kept in very dense conditions in massive barns. They're genetically identical broiler chickens, just to call the name. And there are feast days for virus and bacteria to spread. There's, of course, the issue of land loss and biodiversity loss. People always, from Germany, particularly, come to us and say, oh, it's also green. Yes. But it's just rye grass, where there used to be subtropical rainforest. Then, of course, there's a dietary imperialism, as we discussed with the banks already that markets are controlled. As I was saying, Ireland goes around the world promoting Irish food, selling dairy to the Chinese who can poorly tolerate it, right? But we have actually paid already for this dairy with our taxes through agri-agricultural uh, subsidies. Then, of course, there's the trauma of the meat packers who have to do the killing dirty work for us. There's animal welfare, which is obvious that we are killing sentient beings, hence obviously the title of this organization. 
And lastly, we are not doing the farming communities any favor either, because they are land is bought up by larger and larger uh, corporations, and farmers are sort of restricted in financial agreements, which they can hardly come out of. When people then try to use their voice and even present the facts, even within the confines of the UN, the United Nations, they are up against huge resistance. There was an article in The Guardian recently, and I would only recommend it for everyone to read. The anti-livestock people are a pest. How when food body play down the role of farming and climate change. This report then from the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN, claimed that only 14% of greenhouse gases are from animal agriculture. But that was against the massive resistance they faced within the Food and Agriculture Organization. And that is a problem, that there's a lot of misinformation out there and facts are turned. Another report from the Changing Markets Organization, which looked at 500,000 um, posts, sorry, 285 million posts on their social media. And they found that they're either disparaging vegan diets and science, or they're enhancing animal products by these sort of spreading, um, they're maligning vegan products, vilifying climate focused misinformation, polarizing, bringing about cultural wars, undermining science and conspiracy. Also, there's health watching going on, green washing going on. So we are up against quite an intensive uh, marketing media there. And yet the facts are clear. This is a billion tons of CO2 which are produced uh, by, which are uh, produced due to the change of land use. Now I want to sort of share something with you there. Stop sharing there for a second. Escape this here. Can you see here? Yes, okay. Yeah. So I share my second screen again. This is a, a speech here. There is no sound. Yes, there is no sound, but uh, at least we can see the, the subtitles. There's no sound, no? Yes, no sound. All right. I don't know how to do this um, with the sound, I must admit. Uh, but you can read the capt uh, captions, can you? Yes. So this is uh, Klaus Mitchell from Plant Based News talking on um, at COP28, clarifying the data from the big study from uh, Pure and, and Jemczak, who looked at reducing food's environmental impact. And um, they have sort of clarified basically that the biggest individual impact an individual can make is by changing to a whole food plant-based diet. And the whole team, the whole research team actually became plant-based um, during that um, study. So let me stop that sharing there then. And then I go back to the um, talk. So enough of that. Uh, I thought it was working better, but obviously that's not the case. Actually, it's possible to paste the link in the chat so we can watch later. Maybe, yeah, maybe that might be the best thing to do. Yeah, that might be the best thing to do. Yeah, I was um, not that familiar with uh, all the little intricacies of Zoom, I must admit. I was hoping that would be simpler to do, but obviously that's not the place, uh, the case. Yeah, so. Can you see the presentation again? Yes. Very good. Yeah, so this is just the greenhouse gas emissions of different foods. And as you can see, uh, that is from the study from Poor and Nemchek from 2018, 
And you can see here, the greenhouse gases are by far biggest from beef, lamb, crustaceans, beef, dairy, hair, cheese, pig meat, fish, poultry, eggs. And only then the plants come after that. But there's a big uh, sort of greenwashing going on with these uh, sort of data. There's a, another big question you often get asked, and I come to the health very quickly now, um, is about the transport. Oh, yeah, people say, I'm eating local. I'm eating only local beef. And they think they are better than the vegetarian who eats the avocado, which may have been transported. Now, this graph very clearly debunks that. As you can see, transport is only a very tiny part of the greenhouse uh, gas emissions. So it's much more important what you eat than where it is from what you eat. So that's an important message from this slide. But this slide also, I love it very much. So it just shows one meal, one meal, a lasagna. So you can choose to have a beef lasagna or you can have a, a whole food a vegan lasagna. And you see the massive difference in the greenhouse gases per meal. It can't be any clearer than that. Yeah, I had another a nice study here by um, which uh, I wanted to share over Instagram, but that's obviously not working. Um, so this is a study by Scarborough, vegans, vegetarians, fish eaters, and meat eaters in the UK, and uh, the discrepant environmental impact. And it basically shows that the, vegeta uh, the vegan has a 70% less environmental impact for greenhouse gases. And um, this is a very important paper there. There's a link there for people to see. And that obviously then means that the biggest impact somebody can make for the environment as an individual is to go plant-based. Here's the Irish data. As you can see from Ireland, 37% uh, of all greenhouse gases are from agriculture, animal agriculture, uh, because it's basically the same agriculture, animal agriculture, because 98% of Irish land is used for animal agriculture. So it's basically synonymous in Ireland. Right, basically. And you can see the greenhouse gases for animal agriculture are going up rather than down. And as you know, in the um, report, uh, environmental reports for Ireland, the plan ahead, um, they haven't made really any inroads to reduce that. The national herd cannot be reduced. And this just shows the massive impact animal agriculture had. So if you look at all the land on the earth, 71% of that is habitable land. 50% of that habitable land is used for animal agriculture, but 77% of the animal agricultural land is used for livestock, meat, and dairy. But that's only providing 18% of all calories. That's minuscule. So what about Ireland's health then? Where are we at? Here are the biggest killers. What caused most deaths in Ireland? And there's often a lot of this, this um, information what people think actually kills people. But the main killer is and always was ischemic heart disease. Right? So there's heart attack, cardiovascular disease, dense strokes, all this sort of thing. Stroke. And then next is lung cancer. And there are a few interesting slides on that. Then uh, obstructive pulmonary disease, lower respiratory tract infection, Alzheimer's, and then colorectal cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer. Right, so that's important, just keep that in the mind. Now I'll go through them actually from top down uh, in a, a successive fashion. Right. And here shows them what are the hoped uh, main contributors to those diseases. And tobacco was the main contributor, but as you can see, it's coming down a lot. High blood pressure is still there, and then high body mass index, which comes up, and dietary risks, and high fasting glucose, and then alcohol use. Now the thing is, that the second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth of these, they are all diet-related, right? So they should actually subsume them all into diet-related, really. And high LDL actually is all diet-related too, right? So these are all diet-related. So it's actually, they've made this group dietary risk far too small. They should have included all these in that. So you can see in comparison, Ireland is doing quite bad for ischemic heart disease because it's our main disease and other countries would do better on that. Uh, particularly, yeah, Japan uh, falls into a much better category here. 
And this is a, a global non-communicable disease targets for 2025. And you can see it looks pretty dull. The world is not getting anywhere near of achieving any of those targets. Before we go into the whole discussion, I need to clarify the protein question because people get hung up on the protein question and I just need to clarify. So please bear with me. All protein is made by plants. That's a very important sentence. And if you don't take anything home from this whole lecture, please remember that one sentence. All protein is made by plants. Animals cannot make protein. All of the essential amino acids are made by plants. Because only plants can take nitrogen out of the air to make protein. So that means um, if you eat animals, you're only eating second-hand proteins. If you're eating plants, you're eating first-hand proteins. So that's very, very important. This next slide shows what proteins are in what foods and what consistency, what grouping of essential amino acids are in them. As you can see, if you eat vegetables, fruits, mushrooms, nuts, grains, legumes, beans, you get all the protein. So please, anyone who's listening who has a protein question, you can put that question aside. Protein is not the problem. So just to have that out of the way, because we can start with the discussion. So let's talk a bit about heart disease, the main killer, both in Ireland and indeed much of the Western world. So how does the gout come about? Right, it starts off with red meat, poultry, liver, and all that, and then that feeds certain gut microbes, and these gut microbes produce then a substance called trimethylenamine, and your liver makes or that trimethylenamine oxide, and that is the main driver for arteriosclerosis. So this is important to understand, how does heart disease actually rise? That's how it rises, from red meat, poultry, liver, fish, milk, cheese, eggs, containing carnitine, choline, betaine, that's made into uh, trimethylene oxide, uh, uh, trimethylene, uh, um, and then that's made into TMAO, and that's called heart attack. So that's very important to understand. So you see here again, very simple, the food goes to the intestines, modulation of con uh, cholesterol and, uh, and uh, well, acid disease, and alteration of bile, and then artery um, damage. Here you see how these damaged arteries look like. And I'm an obstetrician gynecologist, so I'm obviously quite interested in the next generation as well as the present generation, because the next generation is obviously very much dependent on the blood vessels of the mother who's carrying this unborn child. And as you can see here, what happens is with these diseases in pregnancy, high blood pressure in pregnancy, preeclampsia, as we call it when it gets worse, and eclampsia, eclamptic fit, preterm births, so babies born too early, stillbirth even, they are all due to vascular disease, which is the same as heart disease. It's the same vascular damage. That's basically what this slide shows. And this is again what this shows here. If a mother has high blood pressure during her pregnancy, she's set up for high blood pressure later on and vice versa. And here it just shows that um, which of these uh, coronary heart disease, heart failure, or stenosis, mitral regulation, they all increase in mothers who have had high blood pressure during pregnancy. However, there's fantastic news. These are two slides of um, a book from Caldwell Esselstyn, who was one of the first researchers who investigated, is there an option of reversing coronary heart disease with food? He basically invited somewhat 200 people to a study these people had very severe heart disease, they had stents, they had uh, heart attacks already, they had um, narrowed arteries, and he offered them a whole food, plant-based diet in a very uh, um, supported environment. And here you see an angiogram. So this is a, a test where you inject contrast medium around the arteries, around the heart. And you can see this gentleman here who took part in the study, his artery was very narrow here. And that gentleman would have gotten a heart attack very badly very soon. And then you can see here, this heart vessel has fully returned to perfect blood flow. Similarly, you see here a perfusion image. So this shows how well the heart muscles perfuse, right? So red is very good blood supply. 
yellow is not so good, green, there's no blood supply. So you see, here's a gap, right? So this bit of the heart does not get any blood. That's before the trial. This is then after three weeks of a whole food plant-based diet. And you can see the perfusion comes back. So that's amazing. So here we are. So just sort of imagine this. We have the main killer in Ireland, which is coronary heart disease. But we have actually a solution which is published in scientific journals. But we are not taught about it. Neither medical school nor in the doctor's surgery. Here's another study, the Lion Diet Heart Study. They put them on a Mediterranean diet. And you can see here very well how, in, um, how many people died off in the experimental group and how many people died off in the control group. And here we have a study which looks at the dietary fats and cardiovascular disease, because as I was saying, cholesterol and uh, saturated fat are the main drivers. In summary, randomized control trials lowered intake of di um, dietary saturated fat and replaced it with polyunsaturated vegetable reduced cardiovascular disease by 30%, which is exactly the same as you would achieve with statin treatment. When I'm in my clinic and I see any patient over the age of 50, they are on a statin, on a cholesterol hammer, a cholesterol lowering drug. But here you see the same could be achieved for free by just trying to change your diet. Again, we are not told this. Yeah, this is just a flow diagram how uh, to prevent heart disease. We won't go through as a bit uh, today. Yeah, so this shows again um, a summary of various meta analysis for the association of key foods and food groups and dietary patterns with cardiovascular disease. So this looks, looks at different foods and how likely it is when you consume those foods to get cardiovascular disease, so heart disease and disease of blood vessels. So you can see, this is a forest plot, right? So see, one is the baseline risk, and to this graph, the risk goes down to the left, and to the right, the risk goes up, right? So if you eat processed meats, your risk shoots up by 40%. If you eat um, refined grains, which is your white toast in a plastic wrapper, Right, from the shop, that increases your uh, risk. If you dairy, doesn't do much. Fish, we don't know really. Fruits lowers the risk. Vegetable lowers the risk dramatically. Nuts lowers the risk even more. And whole grains lower the risk the most. And then for drinks, sugar sweetened, be uh, sugar -sweetened beverages, which is basically your fizzy drinks, increases risk dramatically. Black tea is on the fence. Green tea lowers it. And coffee lowers it up to three cups. Beyond that, it doesn't. And then here's a diet pattern. The Western diet, whereas they often say sad diet, the standard American diet, increases your risk dramatically, whereas the dietary approach to uh, hypertension or the Mediterranean diet or the Puget diet, which are all whole food plant-based, they reduce your risk. It's very simple. Here again, three comparisons, three different uh, trials, the Perimet trial, the Lion Diet Heart Study, and you can see both of these studies reduced MI, stroke, cardiovascular death risk, very significantly. And then you have on the right, left, sorry, on the right, you have a study with statins, and you see the reductions in mortality, stroke, and so on are much less. So the medication is by far not as powerful as the diet is. And as you can see, all these studies are in the same good journals as are the other studies about the medication, but we are not told about them. Yeah, there's a fantastic new study out uh, where they looked at twins. And the beauty with twins is because you often hear, oh, you know, it's all genetic, you know. My father had a heart attack. I'm going to get a heart attack. This is how it is. It's all genetic anyway. But that's where it's good to do a twin study, right? Because they obviously have the same genetics. If you look at identical twins, which they did, right? And the beauty here is you had here adult twins, aged over 18, willing to consume diet, mean age 39 years, and it was a single center study, and 44 people, 21 were put on a healthy vegan diet, 21 on a healthy omnivorous diet. And that's the interesting point in this study, right? So they said, okay, let's make the omnivorous diet, which contained meat and animal products, as healthy as possible. So grass-fed beef, uh, local um, uh, whatever, and all this sort of stuff, right? And then the healthy plant, uh, healthy vegan diet in comparison. 
So then for four weeks, they actually gave these participants the meal. And for another four weeks, they let them buy their own, but asked them to still get here. Right? And you can see here how the LDL, uh, the low density lipoprotein, which is the main marker for the cardiovascular risk, how it dramatically came down in the vegan diet. So just show these things are not genetic. These things are down to our own behavior. Then stroke, as we were saying, is the next killer. And here again, a nice saw study which shows uh, fruits and vegetables, risk of stroke, and a nice meta-analysis of all these different studies. And as you can see, every single one of these studies has shown your intake of fruits and vegetables reduces your risk of stroke. As simple as that. Lung cancer, very interesting. So we are, obviously we always taught lung cancer is all due to smoking. These are the, this is the trend of smoking in Ireland. Just remember this image for a second, right? When I show you the next one. So you can see it's nicely going down the amount of people, the uh, number of people smoke, right? So that's quite interesting. And you can see it's more um, men than women who smoke, right? 90% of men smoke, 13% of women smoke. But then here you see the risk of lung cancer. And what do you see? Despite the fact that smoking is down so much, this goes up, right? So in women, the risk of lung cancer is going up. But you just saw that the risk of smoking, that the incidence of smoking is going down. So what's happening here in Ireland? What's happening? This is happening. Our meat consumption is going up. So yes, we reduce our risk uh, from smoking, but our meat consumption went up. That's what happened. And here you can see that very nicely again. So next then is the obesity. We are in a big endemic of obesity, right? I think the British and Irish are now leaders uh, with the US in the obesity rates. And there's a very nice study there which looked at body weight loss and reduced and looked at what we can do about that. And you may have heard about this new drug, Ozempic. Has anyone heard of this new drug? I sort of head around this semaglutinide, uh, one of these wonder drugs which reduces your weight, right? And this wonder drug acts actually on GLDP1. Mm -hmm. and that is a, a marker which makes you want less food, right? Gerolin makes you want more food. And they did a study with 50, 58, 53 women, 38 en enrolled. They were overweight, had diabetes. It was done in, in Sweden. 12 weeks, single-blinded, and then gave them tylocoid, which is basically a green plant membrane. So basically fruit and vegetables, right? And you can see here, the GLP-1 came dramatically, um, rose up dramatically, therefore suppressing hunger. And as you can see, then the weight of the control group dropped dramatically. So again, we have very clear data how you can actually treat obesity. And here's another very interesting study, the broad study, uh, which is the only study who's ever shown a sustained weight loss. Because all the other diets, the fat diets, they only lead to a temporary diet, uh, weight loss. But actually the broad study with a whole food plant-based vegan diet had found a sustained blood loss um, even at the 12 months mark, which is very unusual. And why is that so? Very, very simple. Because here's a list of foods, how much calories they contain per weight, per 100 gram. And as you can see, um, animal products contain a lot of uh, calories uh, per... Oops, sorry. Yeah. What is, they contain a lot of uh, calories uh, per, um, per, per uh, weight. All these data have led to a, an article recently in the American Journal of Cardiology, which said, are we what we eat? The moral imperative of the medical profession to promote a plant-based nutrition. But as you can see from the previous slide, we have the solution to our main killer. Now it's up to us doctors to actually spread the news and say, actually, we are morally obliged to share this with our patients. And that's what I'm trying to do every day in my practice really. Right. So what's the problem with the Western diet? It's not only the cruelty to the animals uh, the, and the medical harm to humans, 
there's a moral ha human harm, as we said, uh, the slaughter industry, the individuals, the public health scale. All animal foods promote inflammation, tell deaths, and gut permality. We come with a few slides to that. The climate change we already mentioned, antibiotic resistance we mentioned, and the spread of infections. Also, the allocation of nutritional resources is unjust because we have to feed 10 kilogram uh, of protein to a beef to get one kilogram of protein out. So that's not very efficient and it's very wasteful. So why are animal products causing all these problems? Because they first contain new five, oops, sorry, apologies, new five uh, GC, which is a sugar marker on animal protein. All right, that goes then into our bloodstream when the gut is leaky due to the saturated fat, and that provokes a very strong inflammatory response. And all diseases start with inflammation. Also, meat contains pro-oxidants, which is, for example, the heme heme iron. We come to that in another slide. And then advanced, glycon advanced glycation end products, AGEs, and heterocyclines form when you heat animal products, which are directly damaging cells. Also, animal products feed the pathobiome, the bad bacteria, which causes then dysbiosis. And again, as we said, these nasty bacteria, they produce TMA and leukopolysaccharides. A plant-based diet, in contrast, however, contains fiber, vitamins, minerals, polyphenols, plant sterols, antioxidants, and phytochemicals, which are all reversing the aforementioned effects. And that's what you can see very well here. The plant-based diet supports uh, a good gut bacteria, contains very strong antioxidants, lowers the energy intake, lowers the intake of saturated fat, has an anti-inflammatory effect, is higher in potassium and magnesium, and does not contain heme iron, but uh, plant-bound iron. Whereas heme iron, as I was saying, is a pro-oxidant damaging cells. The other thing is the omega-3 and omega-6, right? Omega-3 is anti-inflammatory. Omega-6 is pro-inflammatory. And this is a biological pathway. So omega-3 you find in flax seeds, hemp seeds, and walnuts. And I would encourage all of you, if you don't want to make any other change, just take a good handful of flax seeds, chia seeds, hemp seeds every day. Even if you don't want to make any other change, do yourself a favor. And omega-6 is in all these processed foods, animal products, and oils. So reduce them as much as you can. Often people say, you should be eating fish for omega-3. Well, you shouldn't really, because 98% of fish we're eating is from farm fish. Farm fish is so dense in the tank that they can't get access to the algae which contains omega-3. Therefore, the fish farmer has to add a supplement to the fish tank. Also, farm fish are exposed to very high doses of antibiotics. They are fed by catch fish, so therefore you go up in the food chain, which exposes the fish even more to the contaminants of the sea, such as heavy metals, PCBs, forever chemicals, pesticides, herbicides, residues, residues fire retardants, residues, residues, all these get enriched in the fat of the fish. So you shouldn't eat fish. You're as good an animal as a fish is. You can make your own omega-3 if you have enough ala. Hello? No Hello? Are you okay? Can you still hear me? No, the next thing was the advanced glycation end products. Um, these arise when animal products, animal proteins are heated. And obviously, most animal products have to be heated in order to be consumed. And they are treading loose a cascade of damage, as you can see here in this very busy slide. See, there's the food, right, that produces the AGEs. They go to the receptor for the advanced glycation and products. And that then treads loose a cascade of inflammation, which then leads to our main diseases. So that's very important to sort of remember that. This is then the antidote, which is the prebiotics. You may have heard the word probiotics, which are the good bacteria. In order to thrive your good bacteria in your gut, you need to feed them. The food is called prebiotics. Right? What the prebiotics do is they improve the host, host health, they reduce the diabetic risk, they reduce the risk of obesity, they reduce the risk of inflammation, they reduce the risk of infection, and... Um, reduce your risk of um, 
and central nervous system disorders. And as I was saying, the problem with animal products is that they um, stop the oxygen, the oxygen transport to the mitochondria uh, with the high fat and antibiotics, which are an animal product. And then you uh, release oxygen from your gut lining, which feeds the dysbiosis, and that leads to inflammation. Just uh, um, one little point again uh, to put my obstetric hat on. Here, the heme iron and the risk of a mother to get diabetes during her pregnancy. Why is it such a problem? Well, it's a big problem because not only herself is sick, with the long term consequences that is, there is the diabetes, which will lead to sort of impairment of her sight, and, um, inflammatory response, will lead to long term health risk for her, but also her baby gets already programmed in a poor way. Now, often people are concerned about processed foods, and they rightly should, but it's important to see which processed foods are a problem. And number one, which basically sticks out very much so, is artificially and sugar-sweetened beverages. So Coca-Cola, Pepsi, all these names, uh, all these sweetened drinks, they are definitely right now. But as you can see here as well, animal products drive up the risk of type 2 diabetes, ready-to-eat, heat-mixed dishes drive it up. Uh, they are the main ones. Whereas if you see if they are plant-based, they actually don't make such much of a difference, right? Breads and cereals. So it's more the animal-based processed foods which are causing concern. Now, is there any hope then? Yes, there is. And as you can see, you can increase your life expectancy for optimizing different food groups with diet changes, initiating from various ages. So here's, here's your ages, right? And here's to see what you can do, right? So if you take and do any of these actions, so increase your legumes, increase your whole grains, increase your nuts, reduce your red meat, reduce your processed meat, reduce your sugar. You see, with each single one of these actions, you gain that much years of life. How cool is that? Right? So you're in charge. That's fantastic news. Here again, for the different state, countries, United States, China, and Europe, typical Western diet, this is the life expectancy. And then if you go on an optimized diet, the life expectancy increases for men from 57 to 70. For female from uh, from 62 uh, to um, 73. How cool is that? And then there's actually certain substances in food which we can investigate, and one of them is spermidine. Spermidine is a fantastic factor because we age because we forget to clean up. Right? What happens with our genetic material over time is it sort of gets so sort of broken up and gets wasted, lies around. And that's where we need a mechanism which is called autophagy, autophagy to eat up this damaging, uh, damaged DNA. And autophagy is stimulated by spermidine. And spermidine, therefore, has an anti-aging effect because it promotes autophagy. Right. And you see here how that nicely works with the spermidine there. Right. So it goes over the microbiota, over the diet, um, you get more spermidine, and the spermidine then in turn reduces your blood pressure, increases your antioxidant defense, increases your uh, nitrous oxide, reduces inflammation, reduces artificial stiffness, uh, decreases cell growth and necrosis. So that's very clever here. And here you can see with the spermidine intake, how the um, life expectancy uh, sort of um, um, how the, uh, the risk of death decreases in the amount of it. And here's the studies which show that, different uh, animal studies and uh, life uh, population studies. So it's your turn, if you like. I've had um, a food and medicine conference recently, and um, one of my students was actually reporting his own sort of thought journey, which he did over a couple of months, and he achieved uh, amazing results. Um, but also there's bigger studies which sort of show the same thing. Here, for example, um, this nice study here, uh, association between plant and animal protein intake and overall cost-specific mortality. So they found that a replacement of only 3% of energy, 3% of energy from animal protein with plant protein was inversely associated with overall mortality. The risk decreased 10% in both men and women. 
In particular, the lower overall mortality was attributed to primary substitution of plant protein for eggs. Plant protein instead of eggs. Very simple thing you can do tomorrow at breakfast. Or here another study there. Substitution of animal-based foods with plant-based foods on cardiometabolic health. Remember, heart disease is the main killer in Ireland and all-cause mortality. Replacing only one daily portion of processed meat with whole grains correlated with a 36% lower risk of cardiovascular disease. Swapping in nuts for the processed meat was associated with 27% reduction in cardiovascular disease, while legumes were associated with a 23% reduction. I mean, how cool is that? Simple swaps. No bother. So where can you start? Um, I have to say a big thank you to my um, colleagues at the Irish Vegan. They've done a tremendous job. They have really put everything together you need to start. There's a 21-day food program you can start. There's a list of restaurants, recipes, shopping guides. Please have a look at them. The irishvegan.ie, fantastic website. Equally, I put to your heart the Happy Pair website. They do lovely courses um, for plant-based eating. And I would wholeheartedly recommend to refer people to them who have issues. For example, if people have got issues, they have a special gut revolution course. If people have cardiovascular disease, they have a special heart, um, heart disease course. Really tremendous work. They work together with a gastroenterologist and with a dietitian. Fantastic team. And then our colleagues from the UK, Shireen Kassam started this plant-based health professionals UK, pbhp.uk. Fantastic resource, loads of fact sheets over every single disease, and then also little she sheet sheets where <laughs> they give you a comparison what you're normally eating and then what you could eat instead. So make it very simple, really. And there's also one-to-one -one group coaching. There's a podcast as well you can listen to and it's A21 Challenge. And then if you want to go into the nitty-gritty bit of the science, I would very wholeheartedly recommend Dr. Michael Gregor's nutritionfacts.org all for free, every day, plenty of new videos uh, with scientific evidence, and he always shows the papers in a much nicer way than I ever could. So if you want to just recap a few things I said today, please turn to michaelsnutritionfacts.org. There's no advertising, there's no sponsorship, it's all for free. And um, yeah, it's a fantastic resource and we uh, can be very grateful that we have them. There's many other websites which I should recommend, but I probably leave it at that to get us started. Let me just stop the sharing them. Sharing has stopped. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, good. Excellent. Yeah, that's um, probably enough for me for now. <laughs> and thank you so much for all still being there. <laughs> and um, yeah, I, if there's any questions, please fire ahead. Put your micros on, uh, your mic uh, microphones, put your cameras on, and we can have a nice chat. Yes, good. Thank you, really for the presentation. It's nice. Perhaps we could put it uh, online on our website. Is it possible? I don't know, I don't know if that's the... Oh, we will ask Dennis later, okay. No problem, no problem. Yeah, that can all be sorted. Don't you worry. Yes. Yeah, and obviously you can put the links in there as well to the different organizations, you know, when people want to get started or something like that, you know. That's no problem at all. Yeah, was there anything anyone had a problem with? Anyone sort of saying, mm, I don't know about this? Or would anyone like a bit more information to a certain topic? Or how do you feel about it all? I mean, many of you probably know much more than I do about all these sort of things, and you've been probably wrong in the game than myself, and that's all right. Um, so I'm very happy to hear if you have any suggestions what else we probably should have talked about or <laughs> can amend now. <laughs> Yeah, it was good. Maybe some slides were too fast, but it's very good. I would like to know about calcium. I, I actually know that the like sesame seed and uh, green uh, greens like kale and whatever. Yeah, there are and the nuts contain calcium. But how about uh, how to explain to people? Some people believe that only cows' milk dairy contains calcium, and they are stubborn. So what what is the best explanation? Yeah, very good point, Piotr, and I'm grateful for it. And this gets thrown around a lot, the calcium. And in fact, I've actually given a grand rounds lecture in our hospital, and one of the pediatricians said, Ulrich, you've taken her off the dairy? Basically, as if I've killed my patient. 
because I stopped the dairy intake for the patient, basically. And it was the worst thing I could have possibly thought of done to him. But the trouble is, of course, where does a cow get their calcium from? Where does a cow get their calcium from greens? Obviously, we're not eating grass, but we're eating other greens. So that's the one point. The second point with the calcium thing is, if you look at large population studies, both if you feed teenagers a lot of dairy and then you look at them in later life and see are they getting more factors or less, you actually find they are not having uh, less factors, they actually have more factors. And if you then look generally at a population, see the dairy intake and compare the higher quant quintiles of dairy intake to the lower quintiles of dairy intake and see what is the right of factors, again, there's no improvement in the factor risk if you have a high intake of dairy. So that doesn't tally up as a whole dairy thing. The second thing with dairy is it's an animal product. So it makes your blood therefore acidic. If your blood is acidic, then actually resolves calcium out of the bone. The third thing is our bodies are not wasteful. So that means we take calcium in if we need it. So if you challenge your bones, right, then they will get stronger and then your body will absorb more calcium as long as you have some sort of diet in your calcium. But you can't force the calcium in by overeating calcium. Obviously, you don't want to be calcium deficient, but as long as you have your um, well-varied whole food plant-based diet, you will get enough calcium from the different dark leafy greens uh, in and from the different seeds. You will get enough in. And Hans Diel, God bless his soul, he's recently died, and he was an amazing uh, gentleman who uh, started the CHIP program, um, which uh, has done fantastic help for many, many patients. But he was saying, when he sees people with osteoporosis, he just tells them, and that's what I tell my patients now as well, go to a good outdoor shop, get a good backpack and put it full of stones and every day a bit heavier and then go up a mountain and go every day a bit faster and a bit higher and a bit, uh, and a bit heavier in the backpack. And that will challenge your bones. Or go to set dancing here in Ireland, right? Do some dancing, right? <laughs> challenge your bones. If you challenge your bones, then they will get stronger. But there's no point in overfeeding yourself with calcium if you're not using it. The, uh, another point is if there's somebody listening who is already on biphosphonates, be careful, ladies. Be careful. These drugs are very, very dangerous. They do cause osteonecrosis of the jaw and they don't actually build bone. They only keep the status quo. And the other truth is actually that not osteoporosis causes fractures. It's the faults which cause fracture, where the exercise comes back in again. So if you want to avoid an osteoporotic fracture, get moving. That will prevent the fracture, not the forcing in of calcium, not the taking of dairy. There's no evidence for that. Does that answer your question a bit, Piotr? Yes, okay, thank you. Good. Any other concerns or questions? Anything which came up? Could I ask you a question? I just, uh, just recently, two of my long-term vegan friends they had the babies just there were just two different yeah, yeah two different situations and up when they were nurturing and feeding the babies they went off vegan diet and started eating meat or okay. eggs or some banning of animal products and i to my understanding i think because they said they you know they felt weak or they just you know somehow they felt they needed it i think that they should just get good advice on you know feeding themselves better on the on vegan diet and the problem could be solved that way but i'm not professional in this area so i just would like to ask what you think about that if you know if you okay. would advise the same thing like just you know find better ways of feeding yourself on vegan diet rather than dropping it thank you so much for bringing that uh, that point up Gosha. and i find that very commonly happening you know, mm -hmm. that people are happy enough to be on a vegan diet that suddenly then they uh, get into problems. There's three issues with that, three issues. Mm -hmm. First is that feeling tired and exhausted is often the first step of postnatal depression. And when you have postnatal depression, it has means that you previously had maybe suffered from a low degree of anxiety or depression, which was manageable up to that point but now it's ex ex exacerbated. If you're depressed and anxious, what you need is community with your peers. When you're on a vegan diet, 
as we are so few, you often fear that you lose your peer contact. And that may often be, the I would say that's probably the main obstacle which I see in my practice for people not wanting to adopt a plant-based diet or relapsing because they're afraid to lose the attachment to their peers. So that's very important on the one hand side to be aware of that. Why is that a barrier suddenly? Why is this coming up? You know, just as a thought point, I'm not saying that's for everyone, but I'm saying that may be a factor. That's point one. Point two is the Plant-Based Health Professionals UK website, which I posted there. They have an amazing kids section where there is an absolute abundance of information, particularly for the toddlers and all that. Now, of course, another big factor for feeling tired is vitamin B12 deficiency. And having been pregnant on a vegan diet, you may have not substituted enough B12. And many clinics, unfortunately, don't measure it routinely. So I would definitely advise um, any, um, any person, doesn't matter what diet they're on, to, particularly when they're pregnant, to measure their vitamin B12 levels regularly and to be on a supplement. And obviously, during pregnancy, your demand is higher and during breastfeeding, your demand is higher. So you may have to supplement higher doses. So that is very, particularly if you're breastfeeding, then you need to maintain a very high dose. So that would be the other factor. And vitamin D would be the next factor to look out for, that you have actually supplemented sufficiently on that because it, again, could make you feel very tired, you know. So that would be my main advice, you know. Um, and as I say, with the kids as well, it's all, um, I would suggest for the vegan mother to be, to do everything she can to um, strengthen her confidence to breastfeed as long as she uh, as she really wishes. Because uh, uh, breast milk is by far the best food. There's no question about it. And anything else will come second. And then just wait for the kid to give the clues what foods they will discover. And it's quite interesting um, that kids will actually choose the food they need if put in front of it. There was um, two big was studies. In South Apologies. There was two big studies in South America where they did just that. Right? They just put people, kids, in a big room with all foods. Right? And one kid was actually vitamin D deficient and was going there for the cod liver oil all the time until its vitamin D levels were normal. So kids instinctively know what they need. Um, so let the kid grab food while you're still breastfeeding, and then the kid will discover what it needs, and then obviously make sure that you have a whole food base. There's a very good uh, book from um, Brenda Davis, and there's lots of other good books actually recommended there on the thing. But the funny thing is always as well, if they're on a crisps and um, panta diet, the uh, small children, nobody worries about the nutrition. Right? But if they're on a vegan diet, oh gosh, they're about to die. <laughs> it's quite absurd the schizophrenic thinking of society about this <laughs> yeah yeah so i just you know wanted to ask if you confirm this that you know the solution then can be found within vegan diet for this like Absolutely. young mother and you wouldn't Absolutely. just advise someone just to go off just because this is some special time that you know that it cannot be found in definitely not definitely vegan. and particularly yeah. i would be worried for example for example type 1 diabetes right Type 1 diabetes is a cross-autoimmune reaction between dairy protein and the pancreas, lung and cells. Mm -hmm. And I have always a heartache, heartache, when I do my postnatal water round and I see a mother there who was trying to breastfeed and bang, somebody has put a bottle in this baby's mouth with dairy. And my heart thinks, because I know A, this poor mother would have just needed a bit more support, and B, this kid now, this kid's risk of diabetes type 1, and of um, autoimmune diseases has suddenly jumped up a notch for no reason. So I definitely would not recommend to introduce animal products under any circumstances. Perfect, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, there was another question there earlier. No? Anyone else with any concern, anything you want to clarify or any comment? Yeah, Dennis? Well, Richard, doctor, thank you so much for this evening and apologies for being late, but I was unavoidable. But uh, that was really the, the, the end I, I caught was fantastic. And listening to the feedback from people, everybody loved it. So thank you very much. In, in relation to the vitamin B12, 
Yes. Is there any, is there any uh, metric or measurement that we could say would be advisable, um, I suppose, per adult um, uh, per day? Is there a, uh, Can we measure it out or quantify it? We can, of course, and there's a lot of debate about that. And if you go on the internet, you can get lost in a jungle, really. The best thing is to leave that to the professionals. We are fortunate here now, and that we have a professor of dietetics, Dr. Connor Cur um, um, Curley, who has uh, started a company called Phytofix. He has won the World Food Award with that company, and he provides the only Irish uh, supplement, which is called Phytofix. So I would definitely recommend that. There's 2.5 micrograms of vitamin B12 in that. That's a recommended daily dose. It comes in a powder form. So when you're pregnant and breastfeeding, you could take a bit more. You know, so that's very nice. Um, so that would be definitely the recommendation. There's also different things. Some people, when they have low vitamin B12, they should go to injections. Because you see, you have a five-year storage on board. So if you go to your GP tomorrow, after this talk maybe, right? And you find your B12 is very low, and you're, um, then you should actually have a few injections to get yourself up to speed again. Because it will take too long in a supplement to get there. But I would definitely recommend to anyone who suddenly feels really worn out, taking on winter time, just drain, get your B12 checked, see where you're at. No. Um, thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else with any questions? Yes, Kate. Hello. 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 How are you? Lovely to see you there. Yeah. Um, it wasn't a question. It's just um, after. Um, I'm sorry, I can't pronounce your name. Gosh, Gosaya, Gosaya. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Um, it's just uh, so I do some of the fact sheets for the plant-based health professionals. And uh, we're just about to publish one on iron deficiency. And um, I'm not a health professional, but I've helped collate the information. And iron is also something that's quite prevalent in uh, pregnancy and um, what have you. So um, although apparently, I mean, all right, you'll know, it's no more prevalent in uh, vegans um, to non-vegans. But perhaps, um, you know, that, that they might be tired because they've got low iron levels, perhaps. But also, it's exhausting having small children, whether you're vegan or not. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was shattered when mine were little. So, you know, <laughs> sorry, that's just my little interjection. So, yeah, for those of you who don't know Kate, Kate has been so lovely and come over to my conference, which I had here in early October. And Kate is... Uh, amazing uh, workforce there at the plant-based health professionals to do all these graphic designs and she herself has had an amazing journey if i may say that kate uh, which was even published in a scientific journal where she went from psoriatic um, arthritis which was debilitating her so much that in her 40s she was basically bedridden to now running marathons on a regular basis uh, yeah. so kate is living proof of the power of food and thank you so much for being here uh, this evening yeah. It's been great. It's lovely to see you as well. <laughs> Anyone else with any comments or any? Have you had any of you had any personal experiences, any journeys yourself you want to share or something? Or Dennis, you had a question. Yeah, just in terms of what we'll do afterwards with this, um, all right, it's, we'll, <clears throat> we'll record it and we'll put it up on our YouTube channel and we'll also go on to our website and we'll send you a copy as well. And indeed, really? anybody else anybody else here that wants it, um, it'll also be on our social media for a few days. Um, so we will do something, I think, at this stage on nutrition on our website. Before we did, um, a Dr. Eilish Brosnan did one. She's a, a plant-based nutritionist from County Kerry. You may know her. She did a webinar for us earlier on, but we didn't do a full rundown after that. We just let, let the webinar stand on its own. But I mm. think from now on, we should do a spread on the website about nutrition, about plant-based nutrition, and really, you know, um, I think my, my own encounter with veganism was, you know, I was horrified by what I saw and then I went vegan, but I didn't plan it. And it took me, mm -hmm. I'd say, between six months and a year to get to get steady and to get on top of everything. 
I would I would recommend people research it first and, and plan it before before they do it. But I, that's not my nature. Um, so if we had more information on that, I suppose uh, a, a layman's a talk on, and I think the swaps are are really good. The one you mentioned, uh, the linseed, um, uh, mill linseed, and the mill chia. I think they're a staple. I, that's what I take every day as well. I I walk my way to, to get it. So something like that, we'll put that up, um, alongside and maybe push your your webinar and um the other nutrition as well together. Like maybe do a little center on plant based nutrition. That's that's my cat, by the way, making noise here. Very good. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so that's what we'll do on the website. We'll get that together. Thank you very much. Absolutely, Dennis. And as I say, the good news is there is actually quite an, a nice body of uh, links one could refer to, both, as Kate correctly said, the fact sheets from the health, um, plant based health professionals and the Irish vegan is actually a bit there, uh, Michael Gregor's uh, stuff for people who want to dive a bit deeper. So there's actually some very nice things one can pull quickly together without having to reinvent the wheel and um, keep it there for the best science, you know. So that is actually quite easy to do to have, that, to have the recommended links, you know. Yes, we, we will contact um, the plant based case. We'll be in touch and get some information from you. Um, uh, maybe uh, bespoke for, for to suit our purposes. So thanks. It's great to see you here tonight as well, Katie. Thank you very much. So that's fantastic. I'm really uh, bowled over. We're really looking forward to it here, but this has certainly exceeded expectations, that's for sure. Well, thank you. Thank you, Dennis. It was a great pleasure and honor to be with you guys. And thank you so much for all being here. Okay.